restoring the worship and sanctity of Zion, preparing the return of the king. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah, originally one corpus, is all about renewed worship, the renewing of the relationship between Yahweh, between the Lord and his people after the exile. And the corpus is divided into three different phases. And the first phase was the rebuilding of the actual temple. That's the first generation with Zerubbabel, the descendant of David, and Joshua, the high priest. And in the book of Ezra, one through six, that's the first part when they're rebuilding the actual temple, 539, 515. And then a second round of return under Ezra the priest and the scribe comes in Ezra 7 through 10. And that's a spiritual renewal of the worship of, of God. And then the third part of the book, Ezra and Nehemiah, actually begins in Nehemiah 1. And that happens very quickly after Ezra's return. Ezra's return, 457, 458. Nehemiah's return is 444. And there also is spiritual renewal, but Nehemiah focuses on restoring the sanctity of Zion by restoring the walls and the gates so that the worship of the living God can take place according to his holy standards from the book of the law of Moses. So that's kind of like the structure. And that, so the authorship question is really centering around the first period with Zerubbabel and Joshua. So they have a strong hand in writing that record, of course. And then Ezra the man comes in seven through chapter 10. So he's got his hand directly involved in the writing of that part of the corpus. And then Nehemiah, some people have even called it his memoirs. He is directly involved in the production of a lot of what goes on in Nehemiah, the book itself. And interpersed in the book of Ezra are these Aramaic letters that are official documents that basically make this whole thing legal because of course the context of this whole corpus is the Persian period. The, the region that used to be Israel in the north and Judah in the south after 586 became first the province uh, in the north of Assyria, the northern kingdom, 722. And then when the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 fell, it became part of Babylonia proper. But then when the transfer of power occurred between Babylon and Persia, 539, with Cyrus, the, the great king, Cyrus the Great, 539 BC, then this became under Persian jurisdiction so that the region of Judah is really a province of Persia. It's a province that belongs to the provinces beyond the river, the river Euphrates, and this is the province of Judah that in Aramaic, the lingua franca of the time, is Yehud. So some people call it the province of Yehud. It's actually the province of Judah. And they're under P Persian rulership. And so it's important to intersect the story of Ezra and Nehemiah with the Persian dynasty of the Achaemenids, we call them. And it's a powerful empire. And uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah deal with as it were, a tale of three kings. And then the first king that we must mention is Cyrus the Great, because here is a neat intersection between the scripture, chapter one of, Nehemiah, of Ezra actually quotes and discusses an edict, a decree that Cyrus makes. And this decree that Cyrus makes is actually allowing for the restoration of re worship, localized expression of worship by the people in all the provinces so that they can worship their own God. And, you know, it's good for Cyrus because it creates revenue, temple tax revenue and so forth. And it also allows the local populations to worship their God. And so maybe that's going to create more of a sense of loyalty to the Persian ruler because it allows for freedom of expression of worship. And so this plays right into a fulfillment of prophecy that Isaiah, 
the 8th century BC prophet announced this restoration of worship past the destruction, past the wrath of God for the people's unfaithfulness, idolatry, and so forth, past 586, the destruction of the temple, that there would be a return from exile. And Isaiah speaks to this many times throughout the whole prophecy, but in chapter 44, he drops this name, this Persian loan word, Koresh, Cyrus, and he says, Isaiah prophesies, seeing the future, that this king will restore, will be the catalyst for the restoration of worship in Zion, in Jerusalem. And chapter 44, and then also um, in chapter 45, Cyrus's name is mentioned by name. And lo and behold, there's also in archaeology what we call a cylinder, and it's an inscription that looks like a cylinder. It's at uh, the British Museum in London, and it speaks specifically to the decree of Cyrus allowing in all the provinces a return to worship, a restoration of local expressions of worship. And so that's a neat connection. And so Cyrus is being stirred up by God, the secular ruler, to allow for the wheels of redemption to turn because Ezra and Nehemiah is the restored worship of the Lord in Zion, and it's also preparing for the return of the king, Jesus, in his first coming. And, and so Cyrus is being used that way. The second Persian king is Darius, also Darius the Great. He is the great builder of these one, powerful ceremonial cities in Persia, Persepolis and Susa, and these are monuments to the greatness of the Persian empires. But he's also the one who funds the rebuilding of the temple. We know this from Ezra 6. So he's a, is an absolutely key player in terms of the secular backdrop to Ezra and Nehemiah for the return to the worship of the Lord in Zion. And then the third Persian king is Artaxerxes. And he is very instrumental in that negatively. He interrupts the restoration of the wall. The, 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 local under the, the locals under the initiative of Ezra, we know this from Ezra chapter 4, they're rebuilding the sanctity of Zion, the, the, the wall, the enclosure, and he puts a stop to that Artaxerxes. He's believing the lies that the, the Jews in the land are trying to rebel against the king, so he puts a stop to that. And then fast forward to Nehemiah 1. Now, Nehemiah is a cupbearer at the courts. He's a close servant of Artaxerxes himself, and it's in this context that Artaxerxes, by a change of heart, in no small measure due to Nehemiah's intercessory prayer, he has a change of heart, and now he commissions Nehemiah himself, his cupbearer, to become the governor in the province of Judah and to rebuild the sanctity and to protect the sanctity of the city of his father's graves. That's how Nehemiah pitches it to Artaxerxes. And so, at the outset, we will talk about this in the commentary, to come, but at the outset, we have to remember that there's a very physical dimension to the restoration of the worship in Zion, in Jerusalem. By the fact of rebuilding the altar, by the fact of rebuilding the temple, and by the fact of rebuilding the walls. It, it just creates that sacred space where the people can worship again. And that's an emphasis, but it's also an emphasis on renewed worship through the, the sacrifices and an emphasis on priesthood. So this theme of renewed worship is broken down very systematically, right? A, re, a re, renewed worship means re, a return to the law, a return to obedience to God's law. Renewed worship is also a, a moment where you pause and you make sure that whoever is performing the sacrifices is actually legitimate, that there is ancestral roots tied to the priesthood and the Levites and the 
gatekeepers and the musicians, that whoever is participating in the worship of Yahweh in this renewed worship is actually legitimate. And so you'll have these long lists of people because they need to be able to trace back to the pre-exilic form of worship, whether these people are allowed to, to serve the Lord in the temple. And, and a lot of this backdrop is also found in 1st, 2nd Chronicles, because that's a post-exilic version of the history of the Judean king. And there is a strong emphasis on the temple and the worship and the music, and that was all started by David and Solomon and, and creating this format of how to worship Yahweh through the sacrificial system, through the Levites, through the music, through, the, through everything that entails this relationship that exists between Yahweh and his people. And so in this renewed worship theme of Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a strong sense that they want to go back to the origins of doing it right. There's a strong sense of obedience and faithfulness to the law of the book of Moses, to uh, harking back to the founders for a, re a fresh restart. And then it's in this context then that the wall itself, the rebuilding of the wall in Nehemiah is really a, uh, it's no longer a military defensive wall, including the gates, but it's really a demarcation of the sanctity of Zion. It's, uh, it's almost like the, the, the curtains of the tabernacles. They're, they're, it's not a defensive feature to the tabernacle in Exodus and in Numbers, but it's a marker of the sacred space, a delineator of the holiness of Yahweh. And so the walls and the gates that are being rebuilt are exactly that. They're just setting Zion apart again, renewed worship of the Lord. And renewed worship, this theme of renewed worship is also tied to what the prophets announced. Of course, it's Jeremiah 25. That was the marker, right? Seven years in exile, now they're returning. But also Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and especially Isaiah, when he frames the renewed worship as a fulfillment of the promise of Zion, and he frames this as a new exodus, especially in Isaiah 40, they're journeying through the wilderness. There's a passage that, be, is, that is being made in the, in the old exodus, historical exodus, is passing through the waters in, exodus, in chapter 40 of Isaiah. It's passing through mountainous terrains that now has been made into a passageway. And it's all about the return from exile. And, and so the impetus, the drive of Ezra and Nehemiah is to, to fulfill these prophecies from Isaiah and then the restoration of worship, establishing Zion as the place on earth when one can connect with the living God. And uh, so you're going to see this theme play itself out, the beginning of the restoration. And renewed worship is also connected to strong, staunch opposition. Uh, it's going to come from outside. And so there's a real sense of the need to create pure worship because they are now a minority in the land. They are now surrounded by enemies. And these enemies want to be in on the rebuilding of Zion, but they don't belong. They don't belong because they're not Yahweh's. They're not worshipers of the living God. And so you're going to see this theme of opposition and they're drawing a line in the sand because that's what's at stake. The, the restoration of the, of the true worship of Yahweh is very fragile because the moment you compromise, the moment you intersect with non yahwist it just dilutes the worship. And this was actually what provoked the first exile in, in pre-exilic period. This, the dilution through idolatry, through intermarriage, Judges 2 and 3, becomes an overarching, Deuteronomy 7, these are overarching texts that drive their motivation for the sacredness and the holiness of the worship of the Lord. 
which is, of course, not unlike what Paul says in the New Testament. This is the will of God, your sanctification to the Thessalonians, to the Corinthians. He says, be holy. You have been made sanctified by the work of Christ on the cross. You have been declared holy, not a holiness of your own, but you are clothed with the holiness of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.30. But then you have to act holy, so you cannot be involved in sexual, sexual immorality. You can't be involved in food sacrifice to idols. So there's a, a strong desire and a strong call. Ephesians 5 talks about that, but we should, we should not have partnership with unholiness. And, and so Ezra and Nehemiah is, is, is uh, tapping into this profound theme of the identity of the people of God in worship. The final big heading in this renewed worship theme in Ezra and Nehemiah is it's a now situation and a not yet in that, yeah, the, the worship is being renewed. It is a restoration from exile. They are coming back and they are resetting the sacrificial system. They're sanctifying the site. They're dedicating themselves. They're purifying themselves. They're creating an entire renewal of the covenant. This is a, a big part of that corpus in chapter 8 of Nehemiah, chapter 9 and in chapter 10. It's covenant renewal in the same way that Deuteronomy was that. And, and they're really committed in chapter 10 of Nehemiah. They're doing what they, the, their forefathers did in ex, Exodus 24. They, they ratify the covenant. They say, we are going to obey. We will not neglect the house of the Lord our God. So they're making all these commitments and it seems to work. It seems that the people have a heart to obey the Lord and to follow his word. They read, they read the Bible and it changes their hearts. They weep and they confess their sins. And it starts with Nehemiah 1 and in the confession of, of Ezra uh, in chapter 9 and just this sense of contriteness and brokenness. So you're starting to see, if you will, the, the, the heart change that Jeremiah 31 uh, announces in the New Covenant, but especially Ezekiel 36, 26, where I will put new hearts, I will give you new hearts. So you're starting to see this inclination towards obedience that really wasn't there in the pre-exilic period. And so that's the now, the start of the changes, but it's also a not yet. And, and moments such as the last book, uh, the last chapter of Nehemiah chapter 13, where you realize that they're not there yet. They are compromising the worship. They're compromising the sanctity of Zion. They're compromising the sanctity of God's law. They're compromising on the law of the Sabbath. They're compromising in marrying non-Yahwists with the devastating effects that this will have on their identity as the worshipers of the living God. And so you realize that Nehemiah is just the beginning of the head of the trail towards restoration. And, and so then we launch into the silent years until the coming of John the Baptist. And sure enough, how does John the Baptist comes on the scene of the fulfillment? The next phase of the restoration is there's a voice crying out in the wilderness, quoting Isaiah 40. And so you realize that Ezra and Nehemiah are the forerunners of the forerunner, John the Baptist. They're preparing the way for the return of the king. And then you come to John the Baptist and that, now we're really close. He's, he's a contemporary to Jesus. John the Baptist and Jesus, the birth narrative in Luke, uh, makes that very clear. And, and, and so we're, we're getting closer. And then the final thing as an introduction is to remind ourselves that we too are preparing for the return of the king. And we too are devoting ourselves to being holy. But we're doing this based on a different sacrificial lineage. It's no longer the Aaronids, the line of Aaron and the Levites who falter, who fail to uphold the holy standards of, and, and, and who fail to continue 
to perform the sacrifices according to God's law. So we look to a different lineage, the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who accomplished the perfect, he's the perfect high priest, the perfect sacrifice, and it's by faith in him that he makes us holy. So Ezra and Nehemiah is a direction marker, right? It's, it's pointing us to Jesus. And so we look to him, and it's in him and in him alone that we're made holy. And then out of that, then we have to live out this identity. Be holy, for I am holy, First Peter says, quoting Leviticus. So we live out this holiness, and we offer our own bodies as perfect sacrifices. Romans 12, Paul tells us. So it's a great journey. It's, it's not the destination. The destination is Revelation 22. And would you believe it? The image, the final image, is one of a walled enclosure, a sacred space, the heavenly Jerusalem, and with the gates, beautiful image of the Zion above, the Jerusalem above, Galatians 4. Hebrews 12, 22 and following. These are key texts for us to situate this movement of restoration. And if there is one phrase I think that characterizes Ezra and Nehemiah is don't ever despise the days of small beginnings because it's small, it's tough, there's a lot of opposition, but they're building Zion. They're preparing for the return of the king and we do the same thing today, waiting for his coming, his glorious return, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, as Titus 2:11 and following tell us. So we, we are preparing the way as well, and we follow in the footsteps of our spiritual forefathers. So now the stage is set, and so we turn to the book of Ezra, and the first part of the book of Ezra, which is about the first return under Zerubbabel and Joshua in 539 BC, and then this decree that Cyrus, the great king of Persia, the unifier of all the Persian and Median tribes in the Zagros region of Iran, in Western Iran, and how he had a hand led by the Lord to allow for the wheels of redemption to start moving again towards the restoration of renewed worship in Zion.